Thank you. Thanks, Aaron. Hi, everyone. Great to be here. So cool. Let's talk about shipping tiny WebAssembly builds. Clicker works. OK, so to kind of state the obvious, code size matters, in particular on the web, but also in other places where code size is a resource that you care about. And on the web, the story is the obvious one. It, smaller code generally means faster download, generally faster startup, less mobile data usage, so it makes everyone happier. Smaller code is great. But just for a bit of context before I do a whole talk about code size, sometimes code size isn't the most important thing to focus on. Sometimes you have other factors like assets. Maybe your images are larger than your code, or maybe you're shipping a game that has a lot more game data. So sometimes code isn't the right thing to focus on first, again, obviously. And sometimes just being able to run an application on the web at all is worth a large amount of code. Maybe you need to ship a framework or a VM or an emulator or something, but if without that code you couldn't run it at all, this could be the right trade-off. So all things being equal, smaller code is better, but of course sometimes you do need to use large amounts of code. Okay, so the cool and exciting thing with WASM in this context is it's an opportunity to have smaller code than we used to in many contexts. In particular, WebAssembly is a binary format. So it's more compact than JavaScript because of that property. And usually the code size you'll see is smaller just because of that. WebAssembly is also usually compiled from languages that are statically typed and have good dead code elimination, DCE, things like C, C++, Rust, and Go. The key thing is these languages at compile time have a better idea what code paths are going to be used than a more dynamic language like JavaScript. So they can do a better job of getting rid of things you don't need. But with that said, WebAssembly also brings with it a risk. The risk is that we usually compile code to it from languages that were not designed to have tiny binaries and were not designed for the web. And these are those same languages I just mentioned, C, C++, Rust, and Go, and others like them. So these are great languages, but we're using them for something they were not originally intended. And some issues that can come up are, for example, the standard libraries are assumed to just be there. So if you're writing C code or C++, it's assumed you have Ellipsia on your system. It's just there. You're not paying a code size cost for it. But when you're shipping WebAssembly, you generally are. Various idiomatic code patterns are not necessarily optimized for size. For example, templates, generics, stuff like that, they ex expand out to multiple copies. And these languages have their own standard libraries that don't necessarily match up to web APIs. So on the web, if the APIs are not perfectly matched, we'll need to ship some code to interface between the two, and that has a cost. So there are benefits and risks, and in, in this talk, I'll try to sort of explain how to benefit from the good things and try to avoid the bad things. Okay, let's start with advice for all tool chains, general stuff. One slide of super obvious stuff to get out of the way. Uh, enable compression on the server. At minimum, use gzip. Even better, use Broadly. Broadly is supported in practically all browsers that support WebAssembly, so you should be able to use it if you're listening to this talk. And don't forget to minify your JavaScript, at least on the web. You'll generally have a bunch of JavaScript just to load the WebAssembly to interface with web APIs. That's also code that you want to optimize. Okay, somewhat less obvious stuff. Uh, you should run Binarian's WASM opt tool. Binarian is a toolkit for WebAssembly, and WASM opt is its optimizer. So it can take a WASM file, any WASM file, and hopefully optimize it to a smaller one. And the important thing to keep in, in, in mind here is it can be used no matter what tool chain you use to generate the WASM file. Its input is just a WebAssembly file and it works and tries to make it smaller. The expected benefit you'll generally see when using WASMOPT is something like 20%, so the file will be about 20% smaller, and that's what happens with the LVM WASM backend, so it's what you'll generally see if you use C, C++, or Rust. Uh, 
It can vary quite a lot by compiler though. For example, on Go with GC, the main compiler, the benefit tends to be smaller. On the other hand, on Go with TinyGo, it tends to be larger than that 20%, so it can vary. And also keep in mind that aside from size, Wasmopt can also help with speed, so it tries to optimize the code in general. But this talk is about size, so I won't get into any more detail there, but can help in multiple ways. Okay, so what does Wasmopt actually do that lets it help you shrink code size? One set of things are standard compiler passes, things like dead code, elimination, inlining, et cetera, standard things your compiler may have already done. But it can still help to run them in Wasmopt for two reasons. One is you can run it on the final linked WebAssembly file. <clears throat> that is, after you've linked everything together, there may be new opportunities to optimize. If your toolchain did link time optimization, it may have already done that, but it may not have done it with the system libraries, for example, that are linked perhaps later. Wasmopt runs at the very, very end, so it sees opportunities that might not have been caught. And these general purpose optimizations can interact with a bunch of sort of non-standard compiler optimizations that we'll talk about briefly now. So WebAssembly is different than normal compiler targets in a bunch of ways. And in binary, we have a bunch of passes that try to focus on these things exactly because we assume that normal, quote, compilers wouldn't. So for example, locals are different in WebAssembly than registers. There's an infinite number, they're initialized to zero, so we have a bunch of passes to help there. You can do a bunch of useful things with memory segments to shrink size, like split them up. Control flow is structured in WebAssembly, which is quite different than mo most compiler targets. So we have a bunch of passes to help there, and I'd like to show a quick, brief example of a tiny part of one of those passes. So the remove unused BRs pass focuses on a, a con con tr 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 control flow, as I just said. On the left, you see a tiny fragment which basically does a conditional break, a BR if. So if X is true, it'll break, which means it'll go out of that block, which means it won't execute Y. So if X is false, we execute Y. And the code pattern you see on the right is exactly that, just written with a straightforward if, a negation of the condition, and then y. And that's one byte smaller. So it's just one byte, not much. But that pass has a lot of other tiny little patterns that add up. And that's one pass out of many, and those add up too. And that's how we get to that 20% figure. Okay, so how can you use WASMOPT? Some tools will run it for you, like MS, MS script and WASMPAC assembly script. We'll talk more about each of these later. You can also get binaries from GitHub and run them by yourself. There's also a JavaScript port that you can just get from NPM, so it's e easy to run. And if you're running it manually, you basically do just something simple like this. Just run WASMOPT, give it the input file, tell it the output file, and give it an optimization level like dash capital O runs the defaults, which is typically what you want. You can also tinker with the other flags mentioned at the bottom. You can also run WASMOPT on the web, so I've created a sort of work in progress website that just has a port of WASMOPT to JavaScript and WASM at WASM shrink, shr dot inK, and hopefully my screen will still work. So, quick demo, you basically just give it a file and it'll run WASMOPT on it. You can either choose one locally or give it a URL. Since this is 100% client-side, cores is a concern, but I have some demo files on this server that will work. And you can see in the output, hopefully that's readable, it just says it's processing the file, then it tells you how much it would have been smaller if you'd have run WASMOPT on it originally. And then it gives you a download link so you can just get that file. And basically it ran it for you and gave you the optimized file to use. So you don't even need to install WASMOPT locally, you can just use it on the web uh, just by visiting a site. Okay, a few things that you might want to do. 
the WASMOPT converge flag is useful. It basically keeps running the optimizer while it helps. Typically, after you ran the optimizer once, there's nothing left to do, but sometimes there is a tiny bit of opportunity left. To find that opportunity, we need to run the whole optimizer again, so it takes at least twice as long. So we don't do this by default. But with this flag, it'll just keep doing it, and it might save you a little bit. There are also a bunch of flags for the inlining uh, uh, levels and, and things, which you can tinker with because there's no single universally good set of values for, for these things. And there's a few things that we can't enable by default for, for correctness reasons. It depends on the code base having certain properties. Ignore implicit traps tells the optimizer that no WebAssembly instruction that may trap will actually trap. So a division won't have a divide by zero, which would trap. A load won't have an out of bounds pointer, which would trap. Generally speaking, it's hard to guarantee that these that no such trap can ever happen. So you can probably only use it on a small, carefully uh, handled code base. But when you can pass the flag, it can save a bit of size. And another quite good flag is low memory unused, which I'll talk about for two slides now. So the context here is we want to optimize a load offset. So on the left, we have a load of an add of x and a constant 16. So basically, we're taking x, the pointer, adding an offset, and doing a load. Well, that's exactly what the load attribute is for, right? So on the right side of the slide, you can see a load with that. And that's smaller. We've gotten rid of the add and part of the constant. So we want to do this for size, but it's actually not correct. Uh, the add operates on 32-bit math. It'll overflow. It'll wrap around if it's too big to fit in a 32-bit integer. The offset, on the other hand, by design, will actually trap if it would have overflowed. So their behavior is different, and it turns out in real-world code this actually matters. So with low memory unused, you can actually do that optimization. The idea is as follows. So if in that the large bar that you can see here, imagine that's all of our memory. Imagine that at the beginning of memory we have that red area, a bunch of invalid addresses that we know nothing is ever allocated there, not at compile time, not at runtime. In that case, if we have a pointer, the thing you see at the, at the right, and we add an offset, if that would overflow, so it wraps around and it sh shows up on the other side, if it would wrap around and if the constant offset is small enough, then it would have to fit in that sort of invalid range that's never used, then we know it couldn't overflow because nothing is there to be pointed at. And in that case, we can do the optimization. And this is surprisingly helpful because this is such a common code pattern to just add a little constant offset to a pointer. Saves almost 2% on Poplar, for example, which is a real world code base. And it helps a bunch with speed, too. Okay, another piece of general advice that I think is pretty useful, investigate your code, that is, do size profiling, look at what's in the binary, see if maybe there's things that shouldn't be there, things that could be smaller. Uh, there's a bunch of tools that can help here. There's Bloaty, which is a general purpose tool for code size that looks at binaries. It's quite good, and it has WASM uh, support as of, I think, about a year now. It's great. And two other tools you might use are Twiggy from the Rust people and Wasimoft has a funk metrics pass. So these all can be quite good in finding surprising things in your code that maybe you weren't aware. Okay, so that was pretty general. Let's talk about specific languages and tool chains. So the C and C++ C++ family. If you don't use C++ exceptions, it's good to remember to build with dash F no exceptions, uh, just because that'll get rid of any possible overhead. So if you do use exceptions, obviously don't, don't do this, but if you don't, it's good to pass the flag. Native WASM exception support will help a bunch here. Uh, it will get rid of a lot of the overhead we currently have. But even so, if you're not actually using them, di uh, disable them. RTTI, runtime, type info, similarly, if you don't actually use it, dash F, no 
RTTI will get rid of any overhead. Be careful with templates. Templates are a great and common pattern, but they do sort of duplicate code and end up increasing code size in general. Wasmopt will try to merge duplicate functions, so if templates expanded into duplicate code, they will get optimized out, but often they're not exactly identical, but just almost, so. Another thing to be aware of is virtual calls, the C++ virtual, likewise function pointers. Inhibit dead code elimination. The compiler can't tell where a call is going at compile time, which is not great. So it's best to avoid it. On the other hand, there may be a trade-off here. That is, there are certain code patterns that you can write with virtual instead of using templates, so it actually might be smaller. In theory, though, the best thing would be to not use either virtual or templates and write sort of very simple, low-level code the compiler can optimize out, but that is no longer really sort of idiomatic, normal, quote, C++. C++. So there's a trade-off between these styles. And a related issue is, from the standard library, so things like std vector are fine, but in general, sort of simple, low-level C code tends to require less code size than comparable C++, in particular the standard library. An example is std iostream. If you just do a bunch of simple logging and you use iostream, it's going to bring in a lot more file system and other support code. Printf would be a lot better. But actually, even better than printf, on the web at least, you can just use web APIs. They're already there, and you're not paying a code size cost at all. So on this slide, there's a simple example of using emjs in the emscripten toolchain. emjs is a way to define a C function, but whose body is JavaScript. So that console.log in the middle of the C file, that's actually just JavaScript. It'll be emitted on the outside, and we'll just call into it. So this is basically the most compact way to do simple, minimalistic logging. You're not bundling even printf, no libc at all. You're just doing a quick call to JavaScript and using console.log, which is already in the browser. So it's always good to use web APIs when you can for code size. Okay, a few specific tips for the mscripts in a compiler. Maybe the main thing to keep in mind is to build with O3, OS, or OZ. Those enable the maximum optimizations for size. And their meaning is generally similar to GCC and Clang. That is, O3 focuses a little more on speed, OS a little more on size, and OZ will do a bunch of trade-offs even more for size that may impact speed. And remember to use them both during compile and during link, because they help at both stages. Emscriptnet has a bunch of integration with Binarian and Wasmopt. It'll run Wasmopt for you, so it's one of the tool chains I mentioned before that run Wasmopt automatically. You don't need to do anything by yourself, so you get all that 20%, etc., cetera, that I mentioned before. It's just there. Emscriptnet will also use low memory unused. That is, it'll make sure there's a chunk of memory that's not used and then enable this optimization so you get that benefit. And Emscripten emits an optimized combination of WebAssembly and JavaScript. So it can do things like meta DCE, which is a silly name for doing DCE not just on the JavaScript side, not just on the WASM side, but also between the two as a whole, which sometimes finds more opportunities. A related optimization that we can do is to minify import names. So on the left, you see what you might have an import. It imports from the module env, a function called gldraw arrays. And those two strings end up emitted in your binary. So if you have a lot of imports, that can add up. On the right, you can see a, a, a minified form where we just put sort of minimally sized strings there. And that's better for code size. So this can be done, but like meta DCE, you need to coordinate the WebAssembly and the JavaScript because JavaScript sort of provides this interface and WebAssembly reads from it. So in script, and we generate both files our ourselves, and then we can optimize them in this way. And this is nice, as it saves space on both sides. So otherwise, it would just be a waste to, to add these bytes. 
malloc and free is obviously an incredibly common code pattern. It takes a surprisingly large amount of code, actually, a bunch of K. Mscripten by default uses deal malloc, which is a very powerful general purpose allocator. It's very fast, it's great. We also have ia malloc, another option, which is much more compact, about a third the size. It's obviously not as optimized, but it can be a useful trade-off. If you don't really need sort of benchmarky style, many small mallocs, it can be fast enough. And it's easy to use, just pass a flag, as you can see on the slide, and you can get the code size benefit. A few final notes on Emscriptman before we move to other tool, uh, tool chains. You can enable link time optimizations, including of system libraries with the flags shown here. For JavaScript size, which often ma matters in a lot of projects, uh, remember to use dash dash closure, which runs the closure compiler. This is the biggest single thing for JavaScript size. It'll probably get you about to a half or a third of the JavaScript you would otherwise have. And if you only run on the web, you can pass environment equals web to tell it not to emit support code for Node.js and other platforms. And I, I've thrown a bunch more flags on this slide that you might want to look into later if you care about this stuff, but I'm not going to get into them now. But there'll be a link for, for the slides. OK, changing topic. Let's talk a bunch about Rust. So in Rust, when you're emitting WebAssembly, you may want to consider optimizing for size and using LVM LTO. Very easy to do. Just do op level equals S and LTO equals true. You may also want to use wealloc, which is similar in concept to the eml, like I mentioned before. That is a small minimalistic allocator that is not as optimized as a full-fledged one, but can be a lot smaller. So it's a useful trade-off option to have. Language-wise, like C++, there are a bunch of common things that can increase code size, uh, just due to library support like format and to string. Again, like in, in C++, generics may duplicate code, so templates in the C++ world are sort of similar to this. Dynamic dispatch in Rust, like virtual in C++, C++ may in inhibit dead code elimination, but on the other hand, may be a useful trade-off against using more uh, generic, so a bunch of trade-offs to be had here. You can consider using no std, that is not using the standard library at all. And just a quote from the FAQ, you can get smaller binaries this way, but it's also gonna be a substantial change to the code you're writing. You're not gonna be writing sort of normal idiomatic Rust. And this kind of goes back to what I was saying before in the C++ space. There's this trade-off between writing idiomatic higher level normal code versus sort of writing lower level, simpler, and not using standard library things. So it, it's a, it's a trade-off. There's no right answer here, but it's good to be aware of it, I think. And a final note on Rust, there's a tool called Wasmpack, which you should take a look at. It helps with various Rust to Wasm things. For example, it can do NPM integration for you, which is great. And as a version 0.9, it has wasmopt integration, so it'll run wasmopt for you, get you the size benefits without you needing to manually get it. Okay, some thoughts on Go. Go uh, GC, the main compiler, ships a full runtime, so that's very powerful. It's exactly what you want when you need 100% compatibility with the Go language and ecosystem, but it's not small, it's about two megabytes, so it's not as tiny as we'd like. TinyGo is a new Go compiler that's exactly targeted at the space of small things, as they put it, or small places, sorry. Uh, so WASM is one of their main use cases, and it can work. It can achieve uh, a smaller than 1K for a minimal Hello World program. So it's a great option. The only downside is, as I said, it's fairly new and doesn't support the full language, so you would need to check if it supports what you need in your Go project. But if it supports what you need, it's, it's a very good option to have. And sort of similar to C++ and Rust, there are a bunch of things that can increase code size that you may want to be careful about. For example, interfaces end up being things like pointer calls, so they may in inhibit the DCE. There are packages like Reflect that do runtime 
re reflection that also may incur a code size cost. Again, as with the other languages here, you do need to be careful, and there's a trade-off between higher level code and lower level, simpler, smaller code. And as always, do size profiling and see what you're paying for and pick your options. Assembly script is a cool new language. Unlike everything we've talked about so far, it's been designed with WebAssembly and code size in mind. So it's not an existing language that we're using for a new purpose, but it's a language designed for this. And it has great WASMOPT integration. In fact, it's, it's built with it, so it's part of a whole. And it's very easy to get good code size. For example, dash O3Z for size and speed. The dash dash converge flag is the flag I mentioned before in WASMOPT that keeps running the optimizer. And you can disable assertions too. Assembly script lets you pick the right runtime for what you need. So if you don't need memory allocation, you don't need garbage collection, then you can ship no runtime at all, which is a great option to have. Or if you do, you can ship the proper one. And another cool thing assembly script has is the use math equals JS math option. So this goes back to what I was saying about using web APIs as being the most size efficient way to do things. Uh, so JavaScript has the math object, math.sign, math.cosine, all that. It's already there. You're not paying a cost for it. With this flag, AssemblyScript will call out into JavaScript to do math. So that is smaller than bundling compiled code to do it. Potentially slower, too, so there is definitely a trade-off, but it's a good option. Okay, just a few slides left. So I want to briefly talk about what we can do in the future to make things even better, even smaller. What I think is the one big, the biggest thing that I hope we can make progress on is indirect calls. So this is C++ virtual, dynamic dispatch in Rust, interfaces in Go, function pointer calls in general that the compiler can't see at compile time are bad for dead code elimination. I've, I've said this a bunch of times. Uh, one way we can maybe tackle this is, in LVM at least, we have devirtualization and control flow integrity analyses. And maybe we can use these together with WASM's upcoming multi-table support. So if you look on the left on the slide, they're sort of the current standard monolithic table that a WebAssembly program has. That is a single big table here of size 100. All the functions go in that one table. Alternatively, if we could emit a lot of small tables, each with its own type and each just containing the proper functions, for example, if we have a C++ virtual, you could imagine we put all the implementations of that virtual in their own table. And then if we saw an indirect call to that table, we would know it's only going to be one of those and nothing else. So this could be a huge deal for code size. And if this is something that, that you're interested in, please get get in touch. I, I would love to see us make progress on this, but we're going to need help because it's not easy. Okay, so that was one big thing that I think could make a large impact. I also think we can make a large impact by doing many small things. So a lot of small optimizations add up, as I think I said before. Panarin has a bunch of infrastructure to make it easy to, to do this. There's a control flow graph analysis, local analysis, a lot of tools and useful things, so it's easy to add more. If this is something that you're interested in, we would be very happy to work with you. Please get in touch. And one specific area that might be interesting is toolchain-specific optimizations. So, Binarian already has passes for the script and assembly script tool chains that sort of take advantage of things we know are true there, and they can help a bunch. Maybe we can add more for other tool chains as well if people have ideas. Again, if you're interested to help, that would be great. That's it. Thank you. <laughs>